Hello and welcome to our YouTube channel. Today's video is answering the importance of captive breeding animals. One reason to breed animals in captivity is to hold a good quality gene pool so that animals that their species numbers in the wild are declining badly for various reasons can one day hopefully be repatriated as a species back into the wild. Now if you look at Bentley here, a hooded vulture from Africa, she's captive bred and she's been with us the best part of 20 years, about 18 years and if you look at her little um, notice notice board here you can see we tend to put on the species status of our birds in the wild at the current time now when Bentley arrived she was here least concerned and we have to keep updating this darn notice board because she was soon near threatened in the wild a few years after we got her her species had become near threatened sadly then she became a vulnerable species in the wild and that's a bad place to be for any natural species now look We've denoted her as an endangered species in the wild. An endangered species in the time she's been here. But guess what? Our sign's outdated. Bentley's sign should read critically endangered. Current thinking is some of the vulture species, such as the hooded vultures here, will probably become extinct within the next 60 or 70 years, no matter what we do to help them in the wild at this point. They breed slowly and they live a long time. They don't need to reproduce fast in nature. They live a long time. Their one or two chicks every couple of years is more than enough to sustain the species. Mankind, in this instance, as is often the case, is actually causing vulture numbers to decline at such a rapid rate, it's thought they won't be able to reproduce fast enough now to just sustain the low numbers. She's probably gonna become extinct in the wild. The reason she's becoming extinct can easily be changed. It's, it, it can simply be changed. It's not easy because it comes down to poaching and money and killing and poisoning. But we know it's not a natural phenomenon. We know it's more than capable of humans to completely change the reason they're becoming extinct and we, can, we could theoretically put it right just like that. Having a good gene pool of hooded vultures in the wild means hopefully one day even though they've become extinct in the wild, there'll come a time when we can get these guys back where they belong and flourish and live in the wild. So captive breeding to hold a safe gene pool, a gene bank of an animal for a time when it can go back. Various reasons and various things, this has been done before. The first thing that comes into my mind was the Mauritius kestrel. The Mauritius kestrel, almost on the verge of extinction, a scientist decided, boom or bust, I'm going to catch the lot. The last few remaining, we'll see if we can breed their numbers up in captivity, sort the problem out in the wild, repatriate them. They're doing just fine in the wild. We know that form of captive breeding works absolutely well and it's been proven. This is a young peregrine falcon. It's actually a tearsel, a male peregrine, not a falcon as such. As falconry terms, the falcon's a female, the tearsel is about a third smaller, he's the male. This is a young peregrine. It doesn't have the classic uh, blue, gray, black and the uh, back and the silver tummy. It's a brown bird and they're this colour for at least the first year. Birds for falconry, like they still are in many parts of the world, but here in the UK, were regularly taken from the wild, and they were wild birds trained for falconry, and very good they were too, and they were brilliant at their job, and they soon had a bond with their falconer, and they soon learned it was easier to be a falconer's bird than a wild bird. That's a fact, it just is. They're not stupid. Now, there came a time in Britain where Falconers couldn't collect peregrines. They couldn't get young peregrines from cliff faces because there weren't any. There were hardly any peregrines breeding in the UK. And you'd got, at the time, it was a tail end of egg collecting when it was become illegal to collect birds' eggs, but it still had a huge following. And the rarer a species, of course, the more value there was to collecting its egg. How, how ironic is that? The rarer it became, the more likely those few breeding birds had their eggs stolen. But it was none of these people, egg collectors or falconers, taking them from the wild that made the peregrine rare. 
it was a crop spray called DDT. I'm not going to elaborate its full name because I can't pronounce it. But DDT was sprayed on the crops around the world to kill off insects from eating our crops. And what we didn't realise at the time, it went up through the food chain, from the songbirds up to the predatory bird-eating birds like peregrines. And it stopped these birds breathing. It didn't necessarily poison the adult birds. They could survive with the build-up of toxins. But when they laid eggs, their eggshells lacked calcium, so they just broke. So it, this build-up of this crop spray stopped birds of prey in Britain, almost all of them, but not all, but especially peregrines, from reproducing. So the government then said, no more licenses for British falconers to take peregrines. There's not enough peregrines to allow you to obtain a license to take them. It was a, a license thing, it wasn't a free-for-all. The only option left was to breed peregrines in captivity from the few remaining, or the, the remaining falconers' birds. And at the time, falconers said, how ludicrous. These birds that display to each other in courtship, a thousand feet above the ground, how could we breed those in captivity? What a disgusting government. You've stopped falconry and you, you know we can't do anything about it. But of course a few falconers thought, let's have a go. Turns out, it's really not hard to breed peregrines in captivity. So now, we only use captive bred peregrines with our, as our falconry birds. They breed easily. For the skilled breeders, it's easy to breed peregrine falcons. So sometimes when you breed species in captivity, it's not necessarily for a gene pool to repatriate into the wild when conditions allow those species to thrive once again. Often, by breeding species in captivity, it takes off wild pressure from collecting those species from the wild. You relieve wild pressure from a wild take system. A couple of exotic examples I can give you. The red kneed Mexican tarantula, one of the most beautiful tarantulas sought after by spider collectors and enthusiasts. And they were caught in Mexico by pouring water down a hose pipe into their underground tunnel systems, flooding them, and the tarantulas would come out. The males are worthless, because male tarantulas only live a year once they're adults. The females could live 20 or 30 years, and the bigger they were, the more people would pay for them in pet shops in America and the UK and Europe. So female tarantulas of the Mexican Renly were heavily collected from the wild, and sadly, they became dangerously threatened in the wild. The breeding animals were removed from the population. A common species, pet trade pressure, nearly made them extinct or put them on that road. We breed them all in captivity now. The wild population is left alone, thriving beautifully, and anybody that wants a baby tarantula, you can buy a captive bred one for just a few pounds. Equally, if you're as old as me, you remember the Mediterranean tortoises you could buy in a pet shop for five pounds, all collected from Spain and Greece by their thousands every summer. They nearly all died in captivity back in the 70s and 80s because we didn't know how to look after them. And again, they nearly became extinct or certainly near threatened over collection for the pet trade. Once again, people started breeding them when, they were, when the import was banned and we found out we can breed tortoises just fine. We don't need to take them from the wild. Here's a funny side to that story, how it can always backfire some, well, sometimes. When tortoises had no value to the poor farmers in Greek, in Greece, Greek islands at the time, and they were no longer being collected and exported for the pet trade in Europe, in other parts of Europe, Western Europe, what was happening was they were just used to fill potholes in the road and gravelled over, removing rock, throw it in a hole, it will fill in a pothole, we'll top it off those animals then had no human value. So the irony is, sometimes you've got to get that balance right. If it has no human value, it can be decimated for other reasons. Food, even filling in potholes. Some animals we breed in captivity, it has no bearing on their wild counterparts, per se. Barn owls here, if their habitat is correct and they have nest sites available, and they have feeding grounds available, Barn owls will come and their numbers will increase if you provide their habitat. And we know now, certainly from Britain, that even a low population of barn owls can relatively rapidly increase if its environmental needs are met. We don't need to breed them in captivity for that reason. Barn owls are bred in captivity by their thousands in, in the UK for sure. Uh, there's no license to keep them and people even keep them as pets which is kind of quite sad really but that aside 
there's still a good reason to breed them in captivity. The reason I work with barn owls is to educate people about barn owls, about owls, about birds of prey, and about nature conservation in general. Because this species is incredibly loved. It's photogenic. People all love a barn owl. Voles don't like them. People love them because they look great. Sometimes you've got to have the, the good looking animal to get the, get the message across. The giant panda is a prime example. We employ barn owls to teach people about their plight in the wild, how they can do things to help them, and to care about them. And if people love and care about something, then you're halfway to getting them to want to conserve that animal. So no point per se captive breeding them for its species in the wild. But if we didn't captive breed barn owls, I couldn't work with barn owls, and I couldn't help wild barn owls and other conservation needs by enabling people a tangible way of meeting a barn owl. It's great to see them flying in the wild. People crave to get up close and sometimes even touch animals and that really fuels their desire to help them. So again, another reason we should captive breed animals. Now if anybody knows me personally, they'll know that I'm I'm poo scared <laughs> of cows and horses. I can tell you now, venomous snakes, stinging nettles, venomous insects, they don't phase me whatsoever. Big things like this, <laughs> they scare the bejesus out of me. So while that animal's sitting there, I'll keep talking. If she gets up, there's trouble. This is Marina. She's a rare breed of cow. Now, there's another reason to capture breed animals, of course. That's for our own human needs. Whether we want to use animal furs for clothing, whether we want to breed an animal for food or for milking, whether we want to, well, guys, if you've got a cat or a dog, obviously 50% of you got the wrong animal. <laughs> but if you've got a cat or a dog, you've got an animal that was captive bred over so many generations like these it's become domesticated a domestic breed of animal and you've got that because it's an animal that will work with you and provide companionship as well so we breed animals in captivity for our own needs we breed animals for meat and you can have domestic animals for meat or you can breed rabbits for meat which people don't think of. lots of people eat rabbits and if we all went out right now and caught rabbits to eat the population will probably become extinct because unfortunately there's a new disease that's decimated the rabbits in England uh, with a huge wild harvest of 60 million people or whatever there'd be none left so we breed animals for food and there's other things like mink farms in parts of Europe if you're keeping up with the Covid t stories you know all about mink farms if you want to wear a fur coat there's two choices isn't there we kill wild animals en masse for their fur we go and club lots of baby seals for their fur or we can breed species of animals that breed well in captivity and farm and harvest them for their fur. Uh, that has pros and cons, some people don't agree with it. Um, uh, in, in the UK, mink escaped from farms, actually they, they were released by conservationists. Can you believe that? Animal rights people in England actually emptied and, and allowed all the mink to escape from mink farms. So the poor things didn't get killed and, and their fur taken off for people to wear. Fair enough, if you don't agree with that. They're conservation-minded people, apparently. They've now destroyed an awful lot of the ecosystems in Britain by allowing the foreign mink to kill off animals like the water vole and be massive competitors. So, again, some people mean well and do absolutely stupid things, and you don't all have to agree. I don't wear fur coats, but for sure, I would rather, I would rather people farmed animals for food and fur for the mainstream masses than actually killed wild populations um, because there's too many people for that. It's not sustainable. Wild take for the masses isn't as sustainable. Captive breeding gives a solution to that problem for wild, for wild animals. A really important reason to captive breed animals is actually so people can keep them as pets. No pressure on the wild population whatsoever. These cute baby rats 
actually make some of the most bestest pets anyone could ever have. Super clever, super friendly, and desire your companion. Rats will, without doubt, love you. They've got an affection. And if you keep them and grow them on and look after them and become their friend, they will, without doubt, be your friend. And for the wider world, I, I am sure, because it's my job to find out these things, really, I am sure if no one was allowed to keep pets, the care and conservation of the natural world would suffer immeasurably. Having animals that you can care for, study and love, without doubt, transfers onto your love of nature and conservation on the whole. We love rats here. Look at that. Oh my God, look at that. But for now, let's get them back to their real mum and dad until they're a little bit older and they're old enough to go to new friends, new families, hopefully some children, get them while they're young. who are gonna love these. They live two or three years and you'll learn an awful lot about animals in captivity and in the world by keeping pets. It's a fact. We hope you enjoyed that. Lots of subject matter there to get the emotions flowing for all kinds of parties involved. Do you know there are people that don't want you to keep pets? Ludicrous. But they obviously feel strongly about that. Lots to talk about. Don't forget, the stuff we talk about is based on evidence from our personal experience and research. It's not hearsay, it is fact. Catch up with you soon.